Okay, good morning, everyone. I'll make a start. Um, I'm glad to see that at least some of you have found the right room, and more importantly, that I found the right room. Um, I hope this works out better. Like, it seems a little bit more central. Um, so, hopefully, the, the uh, projector situation will be better. Can everyone see that okay at the back? All good? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so today, again, we've got our, our two hour session. Um, we'll have a break in the middle. Um, we've got some exercises and things like that to, to split it up. So it's not just me talking the whole time. Um, up until now, everything that we've been talking about has been uh, single locus models. And today we're going to be talking about multiple locus models or multi locus models. Um, this is the last lecture that's going to be on population genetics. Next week, we're going to be moving on to a different type of uh, modeling approach to evolution, which is uh, evolutionary game theory. Um, so we'll be switching up a little bit next week. Um, and then a couple of weeks of that. And then after that, we'll be moving on to uh, another um, way of modeling evolution. Okay, so multi locus models. So, fairly reasonable to start off at a single locus models. And there are many circumstances where we can uh, think of um, uh, key traits or characteristics being controlled by maybe just um, one gene. And so, a single locus model can be very appropriate for something like eye color, perhaps. Um, traits like sickle cell. Um, there are many things that could be modeled by single uh, single locus models. However, in general, uh, we like to think about multi locus models just because we are more complicated than just having one gene. Uh, obviously, we have many, many genes. We have thousands of genes. And so we're not going to have uh, models with uh, uh, thousands of loci. In principle, you could. Uh, you know, this is what people do in, in uh, uh, when they model things in computers sometimes. Um, in terms of doing the math, we're going to keep things fairly simple and just maybe think about two loci. Uh, but some important effects um, that uh, appear from those simple two locus models um, that can help us, uh, again, understand some fundamental evolutionary principles through some fairly rudimentary models. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be thinking about two locus models. Um, and uh, again, there's a, a fair amount of terminology here. Um, some of these things you would have met before. So, and some of them are going to be used. So meiosis is going to be a key thing in this today. Um, that's, uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. I won't go into it in too detail. Some of these things you don't need to know in a lot of detail. So something like a hom homologous chromosome is just a, a biological term. We don't really know to, need to know the details about that. Haplotypes and recombination, linkage disequilibrium. disequilibrium yes. Um, and ideas about marginal fitness. This idea here of meiotic drive, that's something that's just an example of how we can apply these, these multi-locus models to understand the biological principle. Okay, so again, there's a bit of terminology. I do think in general, the, the population genetics component of the course at the start is the most terminology heavy. And then as we get into game theory and things like that, it will, it will get less. Okay, so let's think about a simple two-locus model. So simple in the sense that um, we are just going to have uh, two alleles at two loci, okay? And we're gonna think about a diploid population, which I haven't actually put on here. Oh no, I have diploid population there. We wanna think about how many possible genotypes are there, um, if it matters which uh, alleles come from which parent. And then secondly, what if it doesn't matter which alleles come from which parent, okay? So one way you can do this is just write down every possible allele, uh, genotype, okay? so. For example, we've got alleles A1, A2 at the first locus and B1, B2 at the second locus. So A's have to be at the first locus, B's at the second locus. You can't mix them up. But if, for example, we have A1, B1, A1, B1, it's the, the first gene type you can write down. You don't necessarily have to write down all of these. I'm just going to write them down for, um, for ease. So A1, B1, we can think of as appearing from our first parent. So if you imagine this is parent one and parent two, they're contributing these alleles on the left-hand side of that diagonal line. So parent one here is always contributing A1, B1. And then parent two could be doing A1, B1. It could be doing A2, B1, or A1, B2, or A2, B2. And then we're essentially just going to repeat this process. Okay, so for ease, I'm going to copy these. So our second parent is always giving these alleles. And then our first parent 
we're just going to change them. So suppose this one is now doing A2, B1, and parent one. In the third column, we're going to have uh, A1, B2 from my parent one. And then finally, A2, B2 from parent one. Okay, so that's what happens if the uh, order or uh, where you inherit the alleles from matters. Okay, we end up with 16 possible genotypes here. Okay, but just as with our single locus models, we can have scenarios where we don't care where the alleles come from. Okay, it doesn't matter which parent you're inheriting from them from, in which case some of these we can um, identify as being the same. So, for example, Let's go for this one here and this one here. If it doesn't matter which parent you're inheriting from, these are the same type. Okay. Likewise, I'll change the color just to make it a little bit easier. This one here and this one here would be the same. And this one here and this one here would be the same as well. Likewise, go through the middle. That one. This one here, this one here would be the same. And this one here, this one here would be the same. And then finally, this one here, this one here would be the same. So for the first part of this question, there are 16 possible genotypes if it matters where you're inheriting the alleles from. But if it doesn't matter where you're, which parent you're getting them from, then these are just duplicates. And so we've got, what, 12 here, so you knock out six of those, and you'd have 10 unique genotypes. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so as you can see, this is a lot of genotypes to track. Um, obviously, as soon as we have more alleles or we have more loci, this number is just going to keep ballooning, which is a problem. So... Recall that when we uh, looked at our first diploid models, one of the simplifications we made was to um, assume that the population is very large and mating is also random. And we can um, think about just tracking allele frequencies at the gamete or haploid stage in our single locus diploid model. Now we can do something analogous here, but rather than tracking individual alleles, we can do this. But one thing we can do is track something called haplotypes. It's a haplotype in these examples up here, is just one half of this genotype. So what you're inheriting from one parent. So here, this individual has two lots of the A1B1 haplotype. If I go down to say, let's choose this person instead, this person has one copy of the A2B1 haplotype and one copy of the A1B1 haplotype. Okay, so we're gonna be tracking these pairs of alleles as opposed to tracking individual alleles. And that makes things a little bit simpler because we know that we've um, only got in this model four different haplotypes, okay? So I've already answered this question here. How many, uh, well, assuming it doesn't matter, this is another assumption, assuming it doesn't matter which alleles come from which parent. Again, this makes things, things a bit simpler. In this case, we just have four haplotypes, A1B1, A1B2, A2B1, and A2, B2. This is going to be a lot simpler than trying to track every possible genotype. And there are reasons that will become obvious as to why we want to track haplotypes as opposed to tracking just allele frequencies. Okay. So let's define the frequency of haplotype AIBJ to be XIJ. So I and J are just going to be one or two here. And so if we want to just find the frequency of those alleles AI or BI within, uh, within that haplotype, we just need to sum over the appropriate index of XIJ. Okay, so if we define PI to be the frequency of allele 
a i and that's just going to be summing over our x i j's over the j index so if we call this p i and then for b i if we call q i our frequency of allele b i then here, if we just switch the order of those indices around, we just sum over here the J's, but the J appearing first. Okay. So that's nice and simple. We can go very easily from our haplotypes to our allele frequencies. Okay. Now, if you remember, we refer to individuals that have the same allele at the same locus, but from different parents. So for example, in our, our single locus models before we'd have say little a, little a, or big A, big A individuals, we refer to them as being homozygous. We can apply the same principle here, um, but we can think about them being homozygous or heterozygous at each locus, okay? So each genetic location, they could have say A1, A1, they would be homozygous at that locus even if they had B1, B2 at the other blockers. But if they had, say, A1, B1, A1, B1, they've got the same alleles at both of those lo loci, we would refer to them as being doubly homozygous. They're homozygous in this case at both of those loci. That's all that do doubly homozygous means. So the frequency then of each doubly homozygous gene type is just going to be taking the square of the particular frequency of its haplotype. Okay, so a Haplotype AIBJ has frequency XIJ. So if we take XIJ squared, then that's going to be with this random mating in a very large population, the frequency at which haplotype AIBJ associates with AIBJ. Okay. Again, this is just like that uh, scenario where you've got um, a large container with lots of different colored balls in it and you um, pull out one of the balls, that's, you know, so a certain probability of pulling out that color ball. What's the probability of pulling out that color ball again? If the, the number of balls is large enough, it's approximately the same um, thing. So that's just XIJ is the first one, XIJ is the second one. So multiplying together, okay? Again, this is just IJ being one or two, just our indices. Okay. So that's for our doubly homozygous gene types, but for every other combination, we're just going to have two XIJ, XKM with IJ, KM again in set one, two, but with I not equal to K or J not equal to M or both. In other words, just avoiding this doubly homozygous situation here. Why is this the case? Well, here they're different colored balls. This is a red ball, this is a blue ball. You could pick out the red ball first, then the blue ball, or you can pick out the blue ball, then the red ball. And so you have two ways of doing that. So the frequency of every one of our genotypes based on the haplotype. All following so far? Yeah, Jeff? Uh, no, because you could have, for example, um, if we have, say, 1-1 one, one and 1-2, one, then it's not doubly homozygous. Then we only need to care about the doubly homozygous individuals here, because you can think of these as being technically different. Even if they have one shared allele, they differ the other allele. So think of um, another way of thinking of this would be, say, the first locus is the color of the object that you're pulling out, and the second allele is the shape. So they only match perfectly if the color and shape are the same, right? Whereas here, the color might be the same, but the shape differs also. So yeah, make sense? Cool. Okay. So now we've got a way of tracking all the different genotypes, all the different haplotypes in the population. Um, what about how those different haplotypes arise? So again, if we think back to our single locus models, if we ignore mutation, then there was perfect inheritance, right? So if um, uh, your parents had 
alleles, say, um, sorry, if, if your parents produced gametes big A and little a, mm -hmm. then you would inherit those alleles, right? Um, if they were, yeah, if there's no mutation, they're just, you're just inheriting what they're producing perfectly, okay? That's a particular example because uh, there's no recombination. And recombination is a key process for producing genetic diversity. And so what happens um, during uh, so cell division during meiosis? So meiosis differs from mitosis. So mitosis is the normal process of cell division, but meiosis is where we're producing gametes. Okay, so sex cells like um, sperm and eggs. This is, this is probably the heaviest slide for biology terminology. But during meiosis, what happens is homologous or um, uh, corresponding um, chromosomes that you have in your diploid population line up and then they cross over and then there's a break and then it forms new chromosomes from them. So it's easier to, to draw this than it is to describe it. So suppose, uh, let's call this line here our maternal chromosome and this blue one our paternal chromosome. Over again. So maternal, maternal. So if you're a diploid individual, you get one of each chromosome from each of your parents. And during meiosis, they line up and then they cross over, which looks something like this. Thicker. And then we end up with something that looks ultimately like this. So these chromosomes here may contain many, many uh, genetic loci. Okay, so it's just easier to kind of draw it this way rather than doing it just for two. But the, the same process will apply when we're thinking about our two box models. So um, let's just draw an arrow here. Okay, so one way of thinking about this would be, okay, suppose this was your this is your first locus, your A, and this down here underneath is your second locus, B. So A up here, then B down here. You have them cross over. So suppose this individual here was, um, let's call them A1, B1, A2, B2, for example. They cross over. Now this individual over here is going to be A1, B2, A2, B1, if I've got that right. When I say this individual, this individual's gametes that they've produced here. Okay. So they've been able to produce haplotypes that weren't uh, part of that original, their original genetic makeup. Okay. So for example, if we have, let me just write that out. Suppose we have parents. Let's say if you've got a parent that is, say, A1, B1, A1, B1. In this case, they're doubly homozygous. This person is always going to produce A1, B1 gametes. In fact, if they're homozygous at either of these loci, they're always going to produce the same gametes. They can't, recombination is not going to have any effect in this two locus model. Okay. In this particular example, suppose this was your uh, one of your parents, they had this genotype. They always produce A1B1 gametes. That so recombination is not going to have any effect here. Okay, but if, for example, your other parent was A1B2, A2B1, slightly different from the example I just said above. But this one, well, they they produce A1B2 gametes from here. They produce A2B1 gametes from here. The second. So A1, B2 gametes from here, A2, B1 gametes from here, but then recombination allows them produce, to produce some other gametes as well. So they can recombine and take this A1 and this B1, or this A2 and this B2. So they can also produce A1, B1 gametes or A2, B2 gametes. And as you can see, these gametes here are not part of the that parent's genotype. They don't have either of those haplotypes, but they're able to produce them. 
So this is one of the key things about recombination and sex is it's able to produce genetic diversity, even in the absence of mutation. When I'm saying genetic diversity here, obviously the total uh, array of alleles is not changing, but their combinations, and sometimes the combinations will matter. So for example, uh, suppose A1B1, that haplotype is fitter than all other haplotypes. Or actually, no, let's, uh, to make it slightly easier, suppose A2B2 is the fittest haplotype going. If we didn't have recombination, then these guys here can never produce an individual that has A2B2. But we can produce A2B2, that haplotype, through recombination with this guy here. Okay? So you could potentially increase fitness. Okay, well, first of all, we're going to think a model that doesn't have selection, and then we're going to think about what happens when we introduce that selection. So we're just going to be thinking about what happens to our haplotype frequencies in the absence of selection, first of all, okay? So we're going to assume that recombination is the only process because there's no selection, there's no drift. So these are large populations with random mating that we've been dealing with before, so everything is deterministic. Uh, so recombination is going to be the only thing that can change our haplotype frequencies from our Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Now, I've not talked about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium in the context of multilocus models, but the same principles that we've had before can be extended to multilocus models. I'm not going to go through this because it's kind of it's not a, a new concept in a, in a sense, but, but basically the same things that we did for a single locus model apply for multilocus models. Okay, so we can extend that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to uh, multiple loci. And we're going to say R is going to be the per generation probability of recombination between the two loci in our model. So when an individual produces gametes with probability R, there will be right recombination between those, those loci. Okay. And all we care about here is we want to calculate the haplotype frequency after one generation. And we're going to do that by summing over the frequency of all genotypes multiplied by the probability that they produce a particular haplotype. Okay, so again, this is what we did in our single locus models, but now we have the additional complication of there being um, recombination. Okay, so when we did this before, we, we worked out what was the frequency um, of the genotypes in our single locus model, and we multiply them by the frequency of how often they produced a particular gamete, which was just one locus. Now we have to think about haplotypes. Okay, it becomes a little bit clearer when we write it out. So let's think about what our haplotype A1B1. Well, if we call X11 prime the change in this allele frequency over just one generation, this is going to equal, or rather more correctly, this is going to be the from one generation to the next generation. So it's not the change technically, it's what you've gone from one generation to the next. Okay. So all we have here is we're just going to sum over to hit the frequency of all genotypes. We worked out the frequency of all genotypes based on the haplotypes in an earlier slide, right? Multiplied by this probability. So first of all, individuals A1B1, A1B1 that are doubly homozygous, they are going to always produce X11. They have a frequency of X11 squared. If we just go back up here for a moment, uh, where is it? Here, our doubly homozygous individuals have frequency xij squared. So that's the frequency of those individuals, the A1B1. A1B1, I'll write it like this, A1B1 individuals. And they always produce A1B1 haplotypes. There's nothing else they can produce, right? Even with recombination. So 100% so of their gametes. So this would just be x11 squared times by one. How about another set of individuals? Well, how about individuals that are, let's say, A1, B1? And A1, B2. Okay. From above, we had that they're going to be at a frequency of 2, X11, X12. Because they're not doubly homozygous. Remember, these are the only... This is the only weird case here that we have to account for. Everything else is going to be 2xij xkn. Okay. And these guys, well, 
only 50% of their um, gametes that they produce are going to be A1, B1. Again, recombination isn't going to matter here because they're homozygous at one of these loci. So even if they switch around, the only things you can still produce are A1, B1, A1, B2, even with recombination. So 50% of these guys. So we're going to have a half times by two times by X11, X12. And then the same principle applies for individuals who are A1, B1, A2, B1. These guys are going to be a half times by two times by X11, X21, by exactly the same logic that we've had before. These guys can only produce A1, B1, A2, B1. And half of them are going to be A1, B1, which is the one we care about. And then I'm just going to zoom in, just to give myself a little bit more space here. Let's think about individuals who have A1, B1, A2, B2. So these individuals here, I put 50% off with something else or something here. These individuals would ordinarily produce A1B1s and A2B2s. Okay. But recombination can occur here, in which case the, the amount of recombination that's occurring is going to produce us individuals that have haplo or gametes that have haplotypes A1B2 and A2B1. So basically, we want 50% of non recombining. Fifty percent of non-recombining gametes from these individuals. Okay. So here we're now going to have plus a half times by two. So the half is becoming because of this fifty percent. The two is because they're going to be a frequency of two x one one x two two, and then our probability of recombination is r, and we want those that are not recombining. So we multiply this by one minus r. Okay, so just to make sure it's clear where that's come from, 2x11, x22 is the frequency of these individuals in the population. And we want half of their gametes that don't recombine. So that's where the half comes from. And the 1 minus r is the gametes that are not recombining. And then finally, just because I'm running out of space here, it's going to be a little bit tricky. We're adding all of these things together. Here, the other sets of individuals who could produce A1, B1 gametes are going to be A1, B2, A2, B1 individuals. And these guys can only produce A1, B1 gametes by recombination. So here we wanted to exclude the, one, the, the amount that's being produced by recombination. Here we only want to care about the ones that are uh, being reproduced through recombination. And again, they can produce A1B1 gametes through recombination, and they can produce A2B2 gametes from recombination, and they'll do so in equal frequencies. So we want 50% of recombining gametes. So these guys, again, there's going to be a half because of that 50%. Times by the frequency of these individuals, 2x11, sorry, 2x12, x21. And then the probability of recombination is R. That's quite messy. There's a lot that goes on there. But does at least the process that I went through to, to count all of these up make sense? Yeah. You might need to maybe go back over it in your head to make sure it makes sense. But just to make sure, like recombination only matters in these ones here because they're not homozygous at any loci. These guys here, recombination does nothing because if you try to recombine these things because they're homozygous at at least one of the loci, they just end up producing the same things. Okay, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Let's move on. Okay, so we've got this 
me zoom out a little bit, see if I can keep it on the same screen. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to try and simplify this a little bit. Well, one thing we can do is we can gather all of our x11 terms and all of our r terms. So if you note here that there's, I think there's an x11 here, there's an x11 here, x11 here, and then there's going to be an x11 here times by one. So we can combine, I gather all those x11 terms. We're going to have x11 times by x11 plus x12 plus x21 plus x22. So those are just, there's a x11 coming from here, an x12, an x21, an x22. All coming from that. Nice thing about that, can anyone tell me what they think this is going to equal? Do you remember xij is the frequency of a particular haplotype? It's going to be one, right? These are just the frequency of all the haplotypes, which have to sum to one. That's nice. This is what often happens in these models. You, you might find this in the, in the, one of the homework questions. You do a lot of expansion. It looks really complicated, and then you group things together again, and you find out lots of things cancel. Okay. Okay, so what are the other terms? The other terms are going to be the R terms. So again, we can group these together. We're going to have minus R times by, I'm running a little bit out of colors here. We're going to have an R here times by X11, X22. Uh, we'll have a minus R, sorry. And then we'll have a positive R times by X12, X21. Okay, so just two terms. And I've written this as minus R, just for notational reasons that will become apparent in a second. But we can write this as x11, x22 minus x12, x21. And so this is now just going to equal x11 minus r times by d, where d is just defined to be this term at the brackets at the end. So x11, x22 minus x12, x21. This looks a lot simpler now, right, than it did above. It turns out that this quantity here is actually something really important. This is referred to as the degree of linkage disequilibrium, sometimes abbreviated to LD, sometimes referred to as gametic disequilibrium. I'll refer to it as linkage disequilibrium, but you might see this in a textbook, but these are the same things. So we'll talk a little bit in a moment about what this quantity means, but it's telling us something about the association between alleles, or sorry, association between haplotypes in our model. And this association has something to do with recombination. Okay. So it's also possible through a little bit of algebra to write our linkage disequilibrium as x11 minus p1 q1. Remember our pi is just the frequency of allele ai and qi is the frequency of allele bi. It's also possible to write this in this way. I'll leave that as an exercise. I think I put it on the next homework problem maybe. Okay, so we could do this. There's nothing uh, special about x11. We could do this for any of the haplotypes that we had. So for example, x22, this is going to be x22 minus rd. Okay. Just to make sure you guys don't fall asleep, I want you to have a go at finding the equivalent change in frequency, just like we've done here, but for the remaining haplotypes. In fact, you probably just maybe just do it for one of them. So say do it for find x12 prime, okay? So go through the same process that I've been through above. Find out what is x12 prime equal to, and can you write it ultimately in terms of R and D? Oh, sure, yeah. Tell me when. Can I also confuse with uh, like D changes for every 
uh, x i k like x i j prime. That's what you're going to find out. <laughs> I'll leave that up there so that you've got the definition of D. Remember, we want to be thinking about all individuals, think about all the gene types that can produce an A1, B2. And they are they producing them all the time, half the time, half the time, but when they're not recombining, or half the time when, when they're recombining. Those are only going to be your options that you have. Okay. Okay, have a show of hands. Who'd like a few more minutes? Or show of hands, who would like me to go through it now? Okay, more people going, going through. Okay, so we'll do. Okay. So we're going to do exactly the same process we did before. So first of all, let's think about our double homozygous individuals. They're the easiest ones to deal with. They're going to be appearing at a frequency x12 squared. And all of their all of their gametes. Proportion one are going to be A1, B2. Okay. Then let's think about the individuals who are homozygous at one locus. And so uh, recombination has no effect on them, or recombination has no effect on the gametes that they produce. Okay. So for each of these individuals, they're going to appear at a frequency 2x12 xij. And 50% of their gametes are going to be A1, B2. So for each of these terms, we're going to have a half times by 2x12. In fact, you can keep, make things slightly simpler by writing them as you know, this term is always going to be the same on the outside. So we're going to have an x11 plus and x22. That's just saved me writing out parts of the twos again. But if it makes it clearer, we could just write this out in the same format as we had before, plus a half times by two, x1, two, x2, two, two. Okay. Okay, so those are all the uh, individuals where recombination has no effect. Now we want to have individuals who can produce uh, A1, B2, that haplotype that we care about here, but recombination does have an effect on them. So, okay, so they're not, um, they're heterozygous at both of their, their loci. Okay, so for these individuals, there are two types. We can have, again, we're going to care about 50% of their gametes, and they occur at a frequency of 2, X1, 2, X2, 1. And note they're heterozygous at both of these loci. The ones and the twos are different for each of the um, these X terms. And we care about their non-recombining ones. So we want them to be producing A1B2. When they recombine, they'll produce A1B1s and A2B2s. But we don't want those. Uh, we, we want to account for the, the amount of gametes that they're producing through recombination. We're taking it away. So that's where the one minus R comes from. And then we want our final set of individuals. Again, we'll be caring about half of uh, their gametes that they produce. They're going to be occurring at a frequency of two times by X11, X22. These individuals here can produce X. So these individuals can produce the A1, B2 haplotype only through recombination. So these get multiplied by R. All of these terms are analogous to what we had in the previous example. Again, we can do the same trick that we had above, gather all of the uh, X12 terms, and we'll have X11 plus X12 plus X21 plus X22 multiplied by x12. In this term, the brackets is just one, like before. And then now we're going to have, I'll write it as plus r times by x11, x22, 
minus x12, x21. And so using the notation we had above, this reduces to x12 plus rd. And similarly, because this is um, this is unique up to, to labeling, essentially, right? So we can just change the labels around. We'll have x21 prime is going to be x21 plus rd as well. So note here for these ones, the way in which we define this d on the previous slide, as we define d this way, individuals, uh, oh sorry, the haplotypes that appear here, x11 and x22, end up with a minus rd, and the ones that appear here end up with a plus rd. And that's just because of the way in which we the signs differ between these terms and the way in which we've defined it. We could have defined d the other way around. We could have had, uh, we could have defined d to be equal to x12, x21 minus x11, x22. It would have just flipped the signs around and everything. Okay. Okay. So we've got now equations from one generation to the next of each of our haplotypes, and they depend on the frequency of that haplotype in the current generation. And then either plus or minus this RD term. Well, R is a recombination and D is this linkage disequilibrium that we've defined, but not really discussed what it is. Before we dive into that linkage disequilibrium, let's just think about the allele frequencies for a second. So the frequency of allele AI, remember this was just defined to be, we had PI is equal to the sum over J of XIJ earlier on. So remember, XIJ is the haplotype frequency. PI here is just going to be the um, frequency of the allele AI. And then if we think about the change in the frequency of allele AI, well, this is going to be XII prime plus XIJ prime of J not equal to I. Here we've only got two indices, so there's only going to be two haplotypes that we'll be summing over. Okay, so what do we have here? Well, for our x11 and x22, we had an equation of the form like this, right? So we'll have xii minus rd. And then for our x12 or x21s, where the i's and j's are different, we're going to have xij plus rd, which the eagle eyed among you may have noticed that these are going to cancel. So this just gives xii plus xij, which is just bi. And similarly for all of our other alleles. So I could have done this for our, our QJs as well for the second one, because it'll be the same thing. So based on this, we have these equations here for our changes in our haplotype frequencies from one generation to the next without selection. And then we have equations here for the change in our allele frequencies. So what can you deduce from these equations about allele and haplotype frequencies in the absence of selection? in these multi locus models. Do they change? Do they not change? And why do they change? Or why do they not change? So first of all, do the allele frequencies. Do the allele frequencies change when there's no selection? No, nope. this is all going back to our Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, right? The allele frequencies are not changing due to selection. If there's no, sorry, the allele frequencies are not changing when you have large populations with random mating and there's no selection. They settle down and then they stay where they are. Okay, so the allele frequencies aren't changing because this PI prime is equal to PI. Everything cancels out. What about our haplotype frequencies, though? They can change, right? So they can change because we have this plus or minus RD term. So that's telling us that even if our allele frequencies are not changing at all in the population, the haplotype frequencies can change. So the, the ways in which those alleles 
are associated with each other can change over time. So just to jot that down, allele frequencies remain unchanged. But haplotype frequencies change depending on our recombination probability R and our linkage to this equilibrium D. We've got two more slides and then we'll have a break. Okay, so what is this linkage disequilibrium, this D that we've defined? Well, what it's doing, remember we've got D is equal to X11, X22 minus X12, X21. It's telling us something about the association, which or, or the non-random association of alleles at different loci. So if this D is equal to zero, then there's no linkage to this disequilibrium. That basically means this is what you'd expect by random mating. Nothing is unusual here. Okay. They appear as often as you'd expect them to appear. If this is non-zero, then it's, or if, rather, if it's greater than zero, then it means that X11, X22, those haplotypes are associated with each other more often than you'd expect. Likewise, X12, X21, if they're associated less often than you'd expect by definition, if D is negative, then it's vice versa, okay? So if there's negative, then X12, X21 are associated with each other more often than you'd expect. This is a model without selection, but in models with selection, that can tell you maybe something about whether there is an advantage to having these haplotypes associated with each other. So note also that we can write any of our haplotype frequencies at any time in terms of the little frequencies and D. So before we had X11 is equal to D plus P1, Q1. X12 is just going to be equal to uh, P1, Q2 minus D. Likewise, X21 is going to be P2, Q1 minus D. And X22 is going to be P plus P2, Q2. That's just an aside. We can say that we can write down these relationships. So like I said, people care generally about linkage disequilibrium because it's all about non-random associations of things. And it can tell you something about the patterns, the genetic patterns that you see in populations. Are things deviating from this baseline assumption where everything is as often uh, associated with other haplotypes as often as you'd expect them to be. If not, then something else is going on. Okay, last slide before we break. This extent of linkage disequilibrium is also not fixed. And so in this model without selection, this linkage disequilibrium can change and we would expect it to change. So suppose we let D prime be the value of D after one generation, just like we've been doing one generation uh, change in our haplotype frequencies, we can write down an equation for D prime, which is just going to be X11 prime, X22 prime, minus X12 prime, X12 prime. So the change in each of these haplotype frequencies, right? um, rather, it's not the change, it's the, uh, the frequency in the next generation. Okay, so this is the Linkage disequilibrium after one generation. This is the frequency of X11 after one generation, and so on. Okay. And we have equations for these. We've just worked them all out. So we can just substitute them in. We're going to have X11 minus RD times by X22 minus RD minus X12 plus RD times by X21 plus RD. And then we can group these things together. We're going to have an X11, X22 
minus an x12, x21. So we have x11, x22, minus x12, x21. What's this? That's D. It's just our linkage disequilibrium. And we're going to have RD terms. We're going to have, we are going to have, uh, let's see, we'll have minus RD times by each of the um, different haplotype frequencies. So R minus RD times by X11 plus X12 plus X21 plus X22. What's that term in brackets going to equal? One. And then we would also have a plus R squared D squared and a minus R squared D squared. So those will be possible. So this just simplifies down to being D minus RD or D times by one minus R. So that's over one generation. But we can write down what happens in general then after T generations. If we start off with linkage disequilibrium D zero, then each time we're just going to be multiplying it by one minus R. So we'll end up with one minus R to the power of T. Since R is the probability, it's between zero and one, this is going to decay away. So if we were to sketch this, your time here, your linkage disequilibrium, and you'll start at D naught. You'll go down after one generation to here, to here, and so on. So you have an exponential decay. So recombination will act to reduce linkage disequilibrium. When I say reduce, reduces in D is going to be going towards zero. So here I've we've done done this with D naught as being positive. You could do the same as D naught being negative. It would just be flipped. Okay. So it's over time recombination is breaking down these non-random associations of haplotypes. Okay, that's a good point to break. So let's take uh yeah, take about 10 minutes and then come back. Okay. Okay, so the first part of this lecture, we've been talking about a two locus model without selection. Big surprise, we're going to talk about a two model, the first model with selection in the second part. Um, it doesn't change uh, anything uh, in, in too complicated a way in some sense, right? It's it's fairly intuitive because we're just extending the ideas that we had before. Um, you know, we've done diploid models at one locus where we calculated the frequency of our gametes and then we multiply those by relative fitness essentially and then that gives us the frequency after selection we're basically doing the same thing okay we can introduce some different um slightly different notation as well that can help us a little bit to um to uh i guess write down our things like our mean fitness in a slightly simpler way okay so we have to define some things here first of all we need to define fitness for each genotype so if an individual is of genotype a, I, B, J, A, K, B, M. And then we define W sub I, J, K, M as being their fitness. Unfortunately, this is the problem with population genetics. The indices go crazy very quickly. And one thing we can do, again, we're going to be assuming random mating just because that keeps everything nice and simple. We can define the marginal fitness, W, I, J. So for a, a haplotype, this will be. So it's the average fitness of a haplotype. And it's going to be weighted by the frequency that it appears in all genotypes. Okay, so again, we're going to be going from these genotypes down to haplotypes because it simplifies things a little bit. We're not going to be having to ultimately track all of these different fitnesses when we can write things in terms of this marginal fitness. You look like you had a question, but you good? No, no, no. Okay. okay, so. Yes. What's our marginal fitness going to be? Well, we're just going to be taking the average fitness of this haplotype weighted by the frequencies. Okay, so if we write down marginal fitness W I J star, 
well, we're going to be summing over things. We're going to be summing over all of our haplotype frequencies, and we're going to be summing over their fitnesses. Okay, so if we write down XMN as the frequency of haplotype MN, that is going to have fitness WIJ MN. The IJ is here because we're actually caring about uh, haplotype IJ. So the MNs here are just summing over everything else. So we care about individuals who have this haplotype, their fitness is WIJ, and then all the other ones, MNs. We're going to be summing over those. So we'll be summing over M and summing over N. The order of these don't matter. That's our what we're defining to be our marginal fitness. So for example, for our haplotype A1B1, we would have W11 star is going to be X11 W all the ones plus X12 W1112 plus X21 W1121 plus X22 W1122. This is just notation, essentially. I mean, this marginal fitness is telling you something about how fit that haplotype is relative to everything else. So one of the nice things about writing things in terms of marginal fitnesses is that we can write down our mean population fitness, W bar, as a similar sum, this time over I and J, of our haplotype frequencies times by our marginal fitnesses, WIJ star. You can obviously substitute in this WIJ star here, and it should be fairly obvious that you would get the frequency of every genotype and every uh, fitness associated with each of those genotypes. This is just a slightly simpler way of writing it then. That's really all just about notation as far as you're concerned. Okay. So how do we work out, again, we're going to be thinking about our haplotype frequencies. How do we work out our haplotype frequencies after one generation of selection? Well, we need to calculate the weighted fitness contributions from each genotype. We also need to think about recombination. And we need to ultimately divide by mean population fitness because we're thinking about the, the change in uh, the frequency of these different haplotypes and they're changing relative to everything else in the population. So things that are above average fitness should increase and things that are below average fitness should decrease. Okay, so we're going to be dividing by mean population fitness. So again, we'll focus on our A1B1 haplotype I need mean, lots of generality, but just because it's a little bit easier to, to start with that one. So we're going to divide by our mean population fitness first. So we're thinking about the change in the frequency of this different hap of this haplotype. And then we are going to go essentially we go all the way back up here to this slide here. This recall was the change in the frequency without selection. And we had all of these different terms here. We can have all of these different terms here, but now we need to weight them by their fitness. Okay. So I won't go through the derivation of all of these ones uh, in quite so much detail as I did before. But that's where this is going to be coming from. So our A1, B1 double homozygous individuals will be at frequency x11 squared, and they'll have free, uh, fitness w1111. We, as before, are going to have half of individuals who are a1b1, a1b2. Half of those individuals, and recombination is not going to have any effect on them because they're homozygous at one locus. Half of those, in, half of, uh, the gametes produced by those individuals is going to be X1, sorry, A1, 
be one. And they're going to appear at a frequency two x one one x one two. So the half and the two is going to cancel out. We'll have an x one one x one two, and weight it by its frequent uh, fitness uh, w one 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 two. We'll have an x one one x two one w one one two one for exactly the the same logic that I've just done for this one here. And then we have the ones where we have to factor in recombination. Again, the halves and the twos from the previous uh, example where there was no selection, they're just all going to cancel out. We have our x11, x22 individuals. So A11, B, sorry, A11, A2, B2 individuals. We want half of their gametes that are produced throughout, uh, uh, sorry, half of their gametes that are produced. Um, after we account for recombination. And again, they appear at a frequency of 2, x11, x22, so the half and the 2 will cancel. We'll just have x11, x22 times by 1 minus r. So all of their gametes that they're producing that aren't through recombination. And then finally, we can have, oh, sorry, we'll stop the fitness of those individuals. And then finally, we're going to have x12, x21. The gametes that are produced from these individuals through recombination, they can produce x11, b1, sorry, a, b1. They can produce a1, b1 into uh, haplotypes. That occurs at a, a recombination probability r, and their fitness is w21. Sorry, W1221. Okay. As you might imagine, this is going to simplify. Again, we're going to keep our mean fitness on the outside. As before, I won't write out all of these terms again, but we're going to have an X11 times by X11 plus X12 plus X21 plus X22. So for exactly the same reasons as before. We're just going to have an x11 here. Actually, no, sorry, let me rephrase that. These, we're not going to cancel out because of these fitnesses. So the things that I've highlighted in pink here, we're going to have an x11 times by this. So the marginal fitness. Things in pink here, these terms are exactly the same as this, x11 times by all of these terms here. So we're going to have an x11 times by the marginal fitness w11 star. So that's where the, the handy notation comes in. And then minus here, we're going to have a minus r times by x11, x22, W1122 minus X12, X21, W1221. That's just the remaining terms, which I'll highlight here in yellow. So that's all these terms here. That's all those terms. Notice this looks pretty similar to our linkage disequilibrium. In fact, we can make a further simplification here by assuming that our double heterozygotes, so individuals who are have uh, a different allele at each locus, sorry, a different allele at both of the loci on both of their chromosomes. These double heterozygotes, if we assume that they have the same fitness, which is reasonable assuming that these uh, genes are not regulating each other. You don't really need to worry about that so much. That's just kind of put in there as a bit of a caveat, basically as a sort of a null assumption. We can assume that the fitness of these two individuals are essentially the same. So 
This is not always the case, but it's a simplification that we're going to make that applies in certain circumstances. The nice thing about this is that we are going to be able to replace this with the WH and this with the WH here. So they're going to factor out, and then we'll have our linkage to equilibrium again. So we're going to pull this WH outside, and then we'll have this cancelling down to D. That means that we can write for each of our haplotypes the change in the frequency. Well, sorry, the, the, the haplotype frequency after one generation is going to be one over the mean fitness times by x11. Sorry. XII. I know what I've done here. Sorry, I've got a mistake in my notes. I've got ahead of myself in my notes. Let's take a step back. X11, the change from one generation to the next. So current generation is X11. The next generation is going to be X11 prime. It's going to be one over the mean fitness times by X11 W11 star. So it's marginal fitness minus R D W H. That's just using that fact above. And in general, we can write Xij prime is going to be one over W bar. Xij Wij star. So the frequency of that haplotype times by its marginal fitness, plus or minus Rd Wh where we're taking this plus or minus to be a minus when i is equal to j and a plus when i is not equal to j. And that reasoning there is just based on how we define our linkage disequilibrium. If we define our linkage disequilibrium with the signs reversed, then we would reverse these signs. Okay, one thing more thing we can do here is just think about the change in one general. Sorry, Joe. Yeah. Um, just to make sure that now model uh, the fitness of WIJKM is equal to WKMIJ because we are not making a difference between each one on each parent. Uh, the way that you are writing. Yes, I believe so. I understood. Yeah. Okay. okay, so one thing we can do here is we can also just think about the change. I keep saying the change, sorry, because I keep thinking of this equation here. These equations here are, are all just from uh, what we have in one generation, x11, to the next generation, x11 prime. When you think about the change as just taking the difference between these things, so delta xij, the delta xij is just going to be what we have up here on the line above. So I'll just write out again. minus xij. So we can just bring this inside here and factor out the xij's. We'll have one over mean fitness times by xij times by the marginal fitness wij star minus the mean fitness again, plus or minus rd wh. So this is just a you know, an alternative way of writing it again intuitively. If its marginal fitness is above average fitness and there's no recombination or think of just disequilibrium, or even if there's just no recombination. So, yeah, if there's no recombination and its marginal fitness is above average, then it will increase in frequency. This is just sometimes slightly easier to see it in terms of uh, this difference here when it's explicitly written out as opposed to up here. But all I've done is I've just subtracted xij from this. Okay. So what conclusions can we draw then from this model about the effects of recombination on selection? And what I mean by this is Suppose, for example, we have a haplotype A1B1, and suppose it has marginal fitness that is above the population's mean fitness. So in other words, W11 star is greater than W bar. 
So it has above average fitness. What happens to the frequency of this haplotype based on recombination? I'm using this equation above here. So W1 one star is greater than W bar. And for our x11, we had a minus sign here. Any ideas about the interplay between recombination and selection? Mm -hmm. Depends on D. Yeah. Is other things going to increase the mm -hmm. frequency? Like <clears throat> uh, it's going to compete with select selection is trying to increase the frequency, but uh, the combination is trying to decrease its frequency. Mm -hmm. But if D was negative, then it would help. So yeah, which means that they both increase the frequency and then vice versa for if it was below the yeah. W bar. So in the absence of recombination, right? If there's no recombination here, this because W11 star is greater than mean fitness, it's marginal fitness is greater than the mean fitness, it's still going to increase in frequency, right? So if there's no recombination, it would just increase in frequency. Great. Because there's other advantages. Recombination. And because the, the signs of these helping to work out recombination and just linkage disequilibrium are basically going to always be counteracting that, like you just said. Okay, so what this means is that a, you can always think of like a recombination as something that's generally breaking down associations, right? It's kind of rearranging things. And so selection is kind of trying to uh, organize in some sense. This haplotype A1B1 is fitter. So it's trying to, you know, it's increasing in frequency. And it's, so it's associating this haplotype with itself more and more often, okay, because it's increasing in frequency. But recombination is going to be breaking down those associations. So recombination can both be a force for sort of a force that can enable selection in the sense that it produces genetic variation, and you need some variation for selection to act on things. It can produce novel haplotypes, and those haplotypes might be good. So this could have been produced through recombination initially, right? But over time, like as it increases in frequency, recombination is going to be acting to break it apart because recombination sort of uh, is always acting to reduce linkage disequilibrium in the absence of selection. So you remember we had this graph up here. In the absence of selection, linkage disequilibrium, these non-random associations are decaying away. Selection is all about making non-random associations. Linkage disequilibrium is decaying here through recombination because recombination is breaking up those random non-random associations. It's a little bit like entropy, if anyone's familiar with that. Okay, so kind of the, the sort of answer here, I won't write it all out. It's on the notes, but essentially, even if our haplotype A1B1 has higher marginal fitness than population mean fitness, we can still have our change in X1. So we could still have, or right here, can still have delta X11 being negative, even if it has above average fitness. Simply because if this RDWH term is large enough and negative, it can break down those associations, okay? So this is one of the problems and sort of a, a question that's sort of long-standing in evolutionary biology when people think about, you know, why do we see the things we see, the biological phenomena we see? Why does recombination exist? Why do things like sex exist? Because although it can produce novel gene types, it can also break them down. It can break down uh, good associations. So one of the reasons that sort of recombination is, 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 exists, or probably the the reason it evolved in the first place is because it allows you to um, purge bad things from the population. Okay, um, it allows you to also rearrange good combinations together. So it can have a, a good effect, but also it can have this bad effect by purging, um, sorry, by, by breaking down good associations. So in some sense, recombination has a double-edged sword. It has some positive effects in terms of creating new, uh, new genetic variation, 
that selection can then act upon, but then it can also break down good associations. Okay. So another question that we can ask here is how does this linkage disequilibrium affect the mean fitness of the population when all haplotypes are present and at equilibrium? So in this model, we're, we're assuming that the, the fitness of each haplotype is constant. So there's uh, no frequency dependent selection here. So these will be Ws, they're not functions of Ps and Qs and so on, or Xs. So what we know here is that the, the mean population fitness can only be maximized when it's at equilibrium if all of our marginal fitnesses are the same. So for our mean population fitness to be maximized, all of our marginal fitnesses for our haplotypes have to be the same. Why is that the case? Well, if, for example, for some IJ, we had WIJ star greater than mean fitness, some IJ, then increasing the frequency of this haplotype would necessarily increase mean fitness. This is more of an aside, just, just telling you something about mean population fitness at equilibrium. Delve into this a little bit more though. So at equilibrium, if we set x hat ij to be the, the frequency of each of the haplotypes, then we know at equilibrium, the frequency of these haplotypes is not going to be changing. That's what it means for it to be at equilibrium, right? So we can replace our x prime ij from the previous slide a few slides ago with x hat ij. And remember, we had one over the mean fitness times by previously we had xij as we're at equilibrium. This is going to be x hat ij. We can have our marginal fitness wij star, and we had our plus or minus rdwh. And since this WIJ star, our uh, marginal fitness, we just said on the previous slide, is going to be equal to mean fitness, then we're going to end up with, we can rewrite this as the mean population fitness, if we multiply both sides by mean population fitness, is going to equal and we divide by this xij hat. Incidentally, this can't be zero. So just rearranging this equation here in terms of our mean population fitness is going to equal our uh, marginal fitness for any of our gene types here, plus or minus r d w h over x hat ij. Now, this is true for all of our IJs. And remember, depending on the IJ combination, it affects whether this is a plus or minus, right? And we want to maximize this W. So what does this term here have to be? In order to maximize W bar, essentially, we've got four equations here because we've got I can be one or two, J can be one or two. Mark, yeah. Yeah. So for this to be maximized, because of this plus or minus here, this has to be zero. So this is only mean population fitness can only be maximized at equilibrium when r is equal to zero or d is equal to zero or both.
Now, why does this matter? Well, you know, recombination is just a biological process that's just ongoing at an individual level, right? When an individual is producing gametes, there is some recombination going on. We should always expect there to be some recombination. So typically we would expect this R to always be positive. So this means that we have to have D is equal to zero for mean population fitness to be maximized at equilibrium. In other words, in order to maximize this mean population fitness, we can't have any linkage disequilibrium. In general, that's not going to be the case. And so it's telling us that our, our linkage disequilibrium is distorting us away from our maximum fitness. We can have. Okay. One more slide before we slightly shift focus to an application of this. So note that in the absence of recombination, or when the population is not in the linkage disequilibrium, we just have, if we just go back up a second to our delta xij, which was up here, if r or d or both is equal to zero, then we just have the change in this uh, frequency of this haplotype is going to be the frequency of that haplotype before, times by its marginal fitness minus mean population fitness over mean population fitness. Hopefully this will look somewhat familiar. This is exactly the same as our single locus model, but with four alleles rather than two alleles. Why is that the case? Well, the key word here is the absence of recombination. If there's no recombination, then we can treat our say our A1, B1 as just call it C1. Our A1, B2 could be C2. Our A2, B1 could be C3. And A2, B2 is C4. Where C is just another genetic locus. Essentially, we've just squished these things together if they're never recombining, then they're always associated with each other, but they're never being broken apart. So that means that our haplotype model is essentially equivalent to a single locus model where this, these two loci are treated as just one, one locus together. Because they're never broken apart, they can we can just group them together. The case is now this is four alleles rather than two alleles. So when we don't have recombination, we can collapse these haplotype haplotype models down to our single locus model. So again, there's another reason why I mean, if, if recombination is very, very small, very it's negligible, we can essentially ignore it and we can focus on single locus models without having to worry about multi-locus. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to do today was to think about like what some of these models can help us to understand. Because you know we've been going through Quite a lot of like here's a lot of terminology like here's you know these equations that tell us about the change in the frequencies of these haplotypes or something but you might be like why do we care about any of these things um one application list this of these types of models is to understand something called meiotic drive so if you recall during meiosis what we have is we have a cell that say has two chromosomes here or oh, sorry one chromosome that's uh repeated, so one from each parent. Suppose this is our parent cell. It initially divides into two, and it copies both of those chromosomes. And then it divides again, each of those. And we end up with four daughter cells. And those daughter cells at the end, these gametes, they have half the number of chromosomes that we had in our original cell. And they have, uh, yeah, they have half the chromosomes that had in the original cell, and um, they have one sort of, uh, they're evenly represented. Okay, that's the key thing. Okay, so 
Here there were two red, two green. There are still two red, two green. Okay. And that's our like classic Mendelian segregation that goes on. You might wonder why hasn't sort of selection allowed for alleles that distort this process. So by distorting this process, suppose this red alleles on this red chromosome were able to overrepresent themselves. So suppose they killed one of these green ones. So you have two red ones and one green one at the end, say. Well, they've increased in frequency, right? So this meiotic drive is all about distorting this process. So why do we not see, sometimes we do see, but why is it not occurring all the time? This distortion of, uh, of, the, of meiosis allowing alleles to increase in frequency among gametes. If you recall, when we've been doing these models, we've been just assuming that, you know, uh, individual has two haplotypes, they produce gametes in equal frequencies based on those haplotypes. We might have recombination, but still everything is in equal frequencies based on those original haplotypes. You might want to ask, okay, what happens if there's a distortion so that they're no longer equal? Okay. So a key question is then, when will this occur? When does this process occur? We can use the simple two lockers model to understand when meiotic drive can evolve. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're considered two loci in a diploid population. We've got males and females, and they have two uh, loci with four alleles in total. So two of this S lock locus, two of this R locus. And the S2 allele, we're going to assume produces a compound that kills sperm. And it only kills sperm that carry. R1 allele, but it's not going to kill those that carry the R2 allele. Okay, so when the S2 and the R1, uh, an individual that has haplotype S2 R1, they are going to experience their sperm is going to be killed, whereas the R2 allele ones are not going to be killed. Okay, you can think of this. There are, there are parallels in this in other areas in terms of like toxins and antitoxins. If you've got the right combination, you're fine. If you've not got the right combination, you're in trouble. Okay, so we need to define a few things. So let K be the proportion of gametes carrying this R2 allele from parents that have R1, R2. So they're heterozygous. And they have at least one S2 allele. That's a little bit confusing. We'll talk about that in a moment. We're going to have our fitness, WIJKM, as the fitness of males with this genotype. And then R is going to be our recombination rate. So what condition do we need to have on K for there to be meiotic drive? Might be a little bit unclear. But we're going to have some sort of meiotic drive if this K is non-zero. If this K is equal to zero, then, sorry, not zero, a half. If this K is uh, if this K is equal to a half, then you're getting exactly the amount of gametes that you'd expect that have R two compare it with R one R two. Also have this S two allele. Okay. If there is some sort of meiotic drive, if it's different from a half, then we've moved away from that baseline expectation. Okay. So as long as K is not a half. So, meiotic drive occurs if k is not equal to a half. And for S2R2 to spread that haplotype, we're going to need k to be greater than a half. Okay. So, in other words, if it's spreading through meiotic drive, I should say spread through meiotic drive. For this haplotype to spread through meiotic drive, it needs to be disproportionately appearing in these individuals, in their gametes. That's what it means for it to be occurring through meiotic drive or spreading through meiotic drive. Okay, so how do we work this out using our two locus models? Well, we can think about what happens to this S2R2 haplotype when it's rare. Uh, so we're thinking about its invasion. 
and we uh, can only need to consider the genus. We don't care about the whole population. We only care about this haplotype. So we need to care about individuals who can produce this haplotype. So these are all the genotypes here that could produce this haplotype. So we just need to write down their frequencies and then what happens to their sperm and their eggs. And we're going to assume for simplicity that half of the population is male. Okay, so what are the frequencies of these different genotypes? Well, for each of these different genotypes, the top four are going to be um, are not doubly homozygous. So only this one down the bottom is doubly homozygous. So that's going to be X22 squared. Everything else is going to be at a frequency of 2 XIJ XKM. So it's going to be X11, X22, X12, X21. X12, X22, and X21, X22. So those are just going to be the frequencies of these different genotypes. And then in terms of their sperm, well, we're told above here that K is going to be the proportion of gametes coming from, sorry, K is going to be the proportion of gametes carrying R2 from parents that are R1, R2, and have at least one of these S2 alleles. So all of these individuals have at least one of these S2 alleles. They're producing sperm. But this, uh, rather than sort of, they're going to be a 50-50 split between R1 and R2, there's going to be a distortion towards R2, and that's going to be given by portion K. So half the population is going to be male. So we're going to have a half here. We want S2, R2 sperm, and they're being produced in this proportion K. K is equal to a half, and there's no distortion. If K is greater than a half, then it's distortion in favor of S2, R2. We're going to have the fitness of those individuals. And in this case here, we're going to have a 1 minus R because we want to have individuals that aren't recombining. And then for the next row, again, we're going to have a half K times by the fitness. Here we want individuals producing S2, R2 again. So they're going to be ones that have recombined. So there'll be an R here. And then for all of these ones down here, recombination doesn't matter. So here these are just going to be a half K times by its fitness. So one, two, two, two. Half K, W, two, one, two, two. And then a half K, W, Two, 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 two. And then for the eggs, it will have half of the population, and we care about half of their gametes that aren't recombining. So here we're going to have a quarter times by one minus R. So it's a quarter because half of the population male and half the population is female. And then we care about half of their gam uh, their haplotypes are produced. Okay, so we'll have a half times a half, so that's where the quarter comes from. Again, we only care about the ones that aren't recombining here because we want S2R2 eggs. The second row, we only care about the ones that are recombining, so we have a quarter times by R. And then the bottom rows, we're just going to have a quarter, a quarter, and a half. Okay, so we're only caring about invasion. So since we only care about invasion of this S2R2 haplotype, we can assume that initially all of our um, individuals who have the S2 or R2 allele are going to be very, very rare. And we're just going to assume that X11 is going to be, sorry, that X11 should be the one. So uh, think about a population that is essentially just composed of S1, R1. And then we're going to introduce individuals who have this S2, R2 haplotype at a very, very low frequency and then see if they can spread. Okay. Mean fitness then as well is also going to be approximately equal to 1 because everyone has the same haplotype here. Okay, so the change in the frequency after one generation is going to be, well, we only care about 
individuals coming from this one up here. Because in all of these cases, we're going to be having something, suppose x12, x21, and x22 are on order of epsilon. All of these are going to be order of epsilon squared, whereas this is going to be order of epsilon. Okay, so basically we can discount everything in the bottom four rows. X22 individuals from one generation to the next. Well, we are, they're going to appear at a frequency of, let's see. Oh, yeah, that's what we get. So we're going to have this frequency up here, and then we're going to have these terms here. So they have a frequency of two times by x11. x11 is going to be equal to one. And x22 remains there. And then we have sperm. Coming from that table, we had a half k w11 to two times by one minus r. And then we add on the x. So it's going to be a quarter times by one minus r. Two is going to cancel. So we'll end up with a half in this term instead. And so this reduces down to x22 times by k w1122 times by 1 minus r plus a half 1 minus r. Okay, so I was going to leave this as an exercise, but I'll just do it quickly for you here. In order, what we want is a condition for this S2R2 to spread. And we can find a condition on the recombination rate for that to occur, okay, because this recombination rate appears in here. So what do we need? Well, we need X22 prime over X22 to be greater than one for it to spread. It's increasing in frequency. So in other words, we need the term in the brackets to be greater than one. So let's do that. Let's do K W one one two two one minus R plus a half of one minus R has to be greater than one. I'll leave the algebra just because we're short on time. But ultimately you can rearrange this to give R has to be less than K W one one two two minus a half over K W one one two two plus a half. So we've got a condition on our recombination rate. Our recombination rate has to be lower than this quantity for this to spread. If it's too high, then it's going to break down this association and meiotic drive can't occur. So we can conclude from this that meiotic drive cannot occur if K W1122 is less than a half because this would require a negative recombination rate. In other words, if this is negative, then we're never going to get meiotic drive. So that's one explanation as to why you might not see meiotic drive. If you know the fitness of these individuals who are a, uh, S1, R1, S2, R2, you know this distortion uh, amount K and you know the recombination rate, that tells you something about when it can occur. But if KW1122 is greater than a half, then our S2R2 haplotype can invade as long as the recombination rate is not too high. Why might that be a case? Well, if we just go all the way back up to here, right at the start, we talked about homologous chromosomes and this crossing over. Well, think of this as being lots and lots and lots of genes close together, and recombination can occur at various points along there. If two alleles or two loci are very close together, let's do them up here, say, these two green dots, then even if you have recombination, they can stay together. If these two loci happen to be far apart, then they're more likely through recombination to get broken up. So basically this tells us something about, okay, if these two loci 
we just go all the way to the end. If these low, two loci are relatively close together, then it's going to be they're going to there's going to be a lower recombination rate between them. Okay, and therefore it's more likely that meiotic drive will occur if these two loci are very close together. We say that they're more likely to be linked. Okay, that was a little bit rushed at the end. Apologies, um, but. Essentially today, yeah, we've gone through our last population genetics models. Um, the key thing to really focus on today is linkage to equilibrium. Don't worry about terms like homologous chromosomes too much or even uh, myotic drive. Uh, that was just an illustration of the applications of these kinds of models. Um, next week, yeah, we're going to be starting on evolutionary game theory. Okay. Yeah, Joe. Sure. A little bit, maybe like the probability of the combination. Yes. So it, it, it's saying it can't happen. So we can't have myotic drive. It, it's impossible. If if this value here, if we have KW1122 less than a half, then R has to be negative for us to have myotic drive, which is impossible for exactly that reason. So if you have this condition satisfied here, myotic drive cannot occur. Which again helps to explain maybe why you know if the fitness if k was greater than a half but w one one two two was lower then uh, you know those individuals are, are less fit than others then it's not going to be able to spread so you need to have some balance here that essentially we would expect k k to be greater than a half myotic drive to be occurring but the amount that it's greater than a half it can't be offset too much by the fitness detriment to those individuals. So you might, these individuals here who are S11, S2, R2, may be less fit than other individuals in the population. They may be fit, less fit than uh, individuals who are doubly high homozygous for S1, R1. Um, partly because they're killing half of their sperm, right? Say, yeah. um, so if, if, they, if they kill too much of their sperm relative to the fitness of those individuals, if they're having too much of the fitness detriment, then, uh, yeah, essentially these two things have to counteract each other. Is this uh, sufficient condition not necessary? Uh, we well, it's it's the necessary condition is what it's about. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Uh, have a good week. I'll see you next week.